And uh, the book of Psalms is the largest of the ancient lyrical poetry in existence. Now, here's what lyric poetry is. It's a type of song-like poetry. It's distinguished from dramatic and narrative poetry. The Greek word is lyricos, and it means for the lyre, from verses sung to a lyre. Okay. We're, we're just laying some groundwork here, some foundation, okay? Um, and I'll say this to you. The introduction material I give you is a little bit different, but it, but it all ties in, remember repetition, 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 with the study guide. Now the test will actually only come from the study guide, which is what I give you. So I might cheat them, okay? So if you want to get the little extras, you can take some notes in the first hour. But basically your test will come from the study guide, which you are going to have in your hand, okay? Okay, so um, as a part of the Bible, this poetry is religious, obviously. It expresses emotions of believers. It expresses emotions as they're stirred by the thought of God, and it develops in the life of faith. The feelings, it develops joy, pain, fear, security, triumph, and tragedy. It creates confidence and doubt. It causes hope and despair. These are expressed with piety and reverence, but also with honesty and boldness. This is what the Psalms does. And this was the kind of emotion that uh, was expressed by the Hebrew people. If, if you've ever uh, been to a synagogue, if you've ever uh, done any study of Hebrew uh, culture, even to this present day, they're expressive and they're emotional people. If you've ever watched them, uh, in their uh, family gatherings. If you've ever been to a bar, bar mitzvah, you know, there's dancing, there's clapping, there's emotion, they're expressive people. And, uh, you know, these are God's people. God's an expressive and emotional God. And when you read the book of Psalms, which is a collection of Psalms, you find there's deep emotion in the Psalms. There's a lot of expression in the Psalms. So, as a reader, it's, it's sometimes easy to be taken aback by the very blunt, and powerful words that the psalmist used. These people were often in life and death situations. They were attacked by ruthless and cruel enemies. They were betrayed by their friends. Um, they were in natural dangers when they traveled sometimes. There was no lasting peace and no sense of security. Life was daily a challenge to them. Yet they were convinced that the Lord reigned over all the affairs of men. And so they continually rejoiced over the law of God as their God. You know, they were incredible people. Much like the church is today, they were convinced that no matter what their day presented, they were determined to praise God and to serve God. Whenever the Lord demonstrated His sovereignty by direct intervention in their affairs, they simply praised Him. When God's intervention didn't seem to be forthcoming, they lamented over their dilemmas, and they prayed more earnestly. When the affairs of life seemed to be unfair, they analyzed the wisdom of God's direction. But in every case, they reaffirmed their hope in His loyal love and their commitment to serving Him. That's why the works collected became the prayer and the hymn book of the temple. They were collected and they were gathered. And we're going to talk about who, who wrote them and how they were collected, and, and then how they were brought into the temple and were used to worship God. The superscriptions, are you able to follow me here, Nathan? Okay, thank you, brother. Um, I just put this together just in case some of you want to follow along, but there it is. The superscriptions, uh, which can also be uh, considered like Hyperniums, these are those little notices that later editors of the collection added to the heads of some of the songs to clarify the purpose of the pieces. Their melodies or the performers frequently include notations of authorship. About half of the songs are attributed to David with the brief prepositional phrase, uh, something like, of David. You, you, you see them. If you were to open your Bibles now, uh, at many of the songs, right at the top, it's like a heading there. And what that is, that's telling you something. It's indicating information about that song. Critical scholars 
uh, hoping to date most of the Psalms to a, an earlier or a later period, at, at least the post-exilic period, which uh, we're talking about probably uh, 600 or something like that B.C. To, uh, to 150 B.C. around the Maccabean period, contend that the preposition Lamed, which is spelled L-A-M-E-D, should be translated for rather than of because that was its most frequent meaning. This passage would then be dedicated to David, but written by others. But modern uh, uh, scholars uh, kind of have discrepancy with that and uh, write that off and pretty much are going with the fact that everybody pretty much believes it's David. And uh, they can see that David could have written a number of the Psalms but they say that most of the Psalms were written much later and that even Davidic compositions were heavily edited. So, at least half of the Psalms we know for sure were written by David. You got roughly 73 of 150 Psalms written by David. There's more than enough evidence, however, to sustain the traditional view that David wrote at least half of it. And many of the others were written in the nation's early period rather than later. Although some of the Psalms, for example, like Psalms 126, were definitely post-exilic. Um, there is evidence in the scripture that attests that David was a singer of Psalms, a composer, and the primary organizer of temple music. And we find that in 2 Samuel uh, 6.5, 1 Chronicles 15.3 through 28, and 16.4, 43 through 43, 23, 1 through 5. And then secondly, we also see that in the New Testament, it often cites passages from the Psalter, which it, Psalter just means the book of Psalms. Uh, and it attributes David's authorship to them or uses his name in general for the whole collection. And then thirdly, the literary form of the Psalms with its parallelism and meter common vocabulary and use of verbal forms finds identical use in the poetry of Canaan dating back some 400 years before David. So there's no reason to date the book of Psalms later on than the basis of style and vocabulary. Fourth, there's an ample evidence in the Bible. About the three one and outside the Bible, we see the early Hebrew substantiates this too. To support the use of the preposition Lamed as an indicator of the author or the sender of the document. So basically what we've said here, and uh, you see it up here, we've got plenty of good evidence. Literary form matches that of David's time, which I just covered these, but I'm going to go over them again. Abundant evidence in scripture and secular documents support the preposition use or the prepositional use of uh, Lamed as an indicator of who the author or David the wrote of the document 73, and we think more. However, we can't, you know, confidently say that those additional ones that do not obviously uh, show evidence that he did write it, but we feel like he did. Everybody okay? Okay? Um, each psalm has to be studied in its totality because the preposition can be used in different ways, even within the heading. But some of them actually have this lamed of authorship in the context. There are a few that actually have it that way. And uh, so we also find evidence there. The many superscriptions to the Psalms, whether they are notes of authorship, occasion, performance, or musical notations, may not have been part of the original composition, but they record the ancient traditions about the origin and use of the Psalms and therefore may be taken seriously as part of the study of the collection. So you get also information. You get important knowledge or details uh, sometimes in the Lament. Okay, talking about the Book of Praise. The collection is called the Book of Psalms and it's based on its Greek title, a psalm is a composition sung to the accompaniment of stringed instruments. The word mizmar in Hebrew and uh, psalmos in Greek. The Hebrew title is the book of praises. 
or simply just praises. This is most fitting for the collection because almost all the psalms include praise in one way or another. The lament psalms progress from prayer to praise. The praise often offered as a vow to be fulfilled in the sanctuary once God answered the prayer. So think about that for a minute. A, a lot of times when they would pray, when they would seek God, they would offer a vow to God and say, God, when you answer my prayer, I commit to praise. I commit to worship you. The type of psalm indicates whether the praise is current or vow. English translation doesn't always have the ability to clarify this. Now, all of us have probably read a song, and by the time we got to the end of it, we were going, Ew. you know. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to read this one. There is a problem in some of the songs with the English being able to translate the full expression of what the Hebrew is communicating. But in every psalm, there is a vow to praise, and there are elements of praise. We just can't always see it because we don't understand the full Hebraic meaning, but it's there. Because the psalms capture the religious ideas of the Israelites, many of them were given over to the temple to use in the services. They often exult in the privilege of entering God's courts and drawing near to his altar and celebrate the ordinances of the sanctuary ritual. In Hebrew worship, there was, uh, and there still is, a lot of ritual, uh, a lot of ceremonial procedure that takes place. And to them, and with their understanding, uh, it's more than just uh, sacrimonial, you know, uh, happenstance that becomes just ritualistically bored, if you know what I'm saying. It's ceremonial to them. They actually anticipate what they know is about to happen. Uh, if, if some of you have maybe a Catholic background, uh, there's a tendency in Catholicism to get almost like, you know, you know what's coming next, and you know what they're going to say next, and, and everything's just very, very uh, mundane if you haven't really had a personal relationship with Christ because the, the service is very, very ordered and very structured and it's very ceremonial. Well, the Hebrew people have a lot of the same type of ritualism, uh, not the same type, but the same type of structure, uh, the ritualistic. The difference is, is that they have great anticipation it, because it has deep meaning. It has deep heartfelt expression to them because in theirs, similar to the Catholics, the Catholics also have deep meaning behind what they do. But the difference is with the Israelite people, uh, it was their ancestors. You understand what I'm saying? This was their forefathers who experienced these, these trials or, or these great uh, miracles and things that are being represented and carried out. And it is typology. And so they actually anticipate what's about to happen in, the, in their worship service, what's about to happen in this psalm as they read it. And that's why they're able to to, to uh, recite a psalm or participate in a, a uh, uh, in the synagogue and, and, and do something that they know this is coming next and this is next. They anticipate it. It's like, oh, we're about to do this and we're about to read this song. And they get excited about it, you know. It's kind of like you do here uh, in your church or, or if you don't go here wherever you are. And you, you, may, you may see that uh, there, the music and you hear that familiar tune and you think, oh, man, I love this song, you know. Uh, probably one of the reasons is is maybe you do like the melody or, or the beat or something, but probably because you had an experience at some point um, when that song was playing or God touched your heart while your hands were lifted and from that day forth, you, you, you maybe you changed it. From that day forth, you just love that song. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm that way. I, I, there are songs 20 years ago that... When I hear that song, then it's just like God takes me there again, and that's just a, there's a fresh new. You know what I'm saying. Well, this is what happens many times, and I want to say to you that these songs are to be this real to you, and they're, they're to be these kind of experiences to you. And today, we're going to talk about how they can be, because we're going to talk about context. We're going to talk about background and understanding where they came from and what they meant to the people who wrote them and and where we can be able to grasp their feelings and their emotions and their experience and 
then when you read the psalm, you enter into their experience and you're able to touch God in that way and relate to God in that way and it becomes powerful. Amen? So the psalms are written in a more concentrated form of discourse than other literary forms with more consciously artistic elements, images, symbols, figures of speech, emotive vocabulary, and multiple meanings. Often the reader has to become familiar with the way their poetic discourse works in order to gain the full and intended meaning of the text. So I know that's a lot of wording right there, but there's a lot of content in what I just said. Okay? A lot of wording in what I just said, too. But uh, there's, a, there's a lot of expression in the psalm. You can take a psalm and spend some time with it, and it can fill you with understanding. It can fill you with new knowledge and reality about who God is and who God's people are and what God has for you. I want to tell you, what will come out of an experience with the psalm will be a new revelation of who God is, who you are, who God's people were, what God is in the earth. I mean, it's just like there's so much in a psalm. Amen? Figurative language is used to express more than straightforward prepositional statements can express. It conveys both emotional and intellectual connotations. And it draws on the culture and history with allusions and references. To understand the psalm and their impact, we have to try to live in that culture and sense Israel's experience among their pagan neighbors who usually sought to destroy them. I'll tell you, our culture is beginning to change. And we're beginning to get a little inkling of how maybe they felt. I mean, it's still more overseas, but it's trying to come our way. Amen? Um, but you, when you, when you hear what I'm teaching and what I begin to express now, you're going to begin to get a new light on the Psalms. Uh, daily they lived under the threat of destruction. Daily they lived under uh, oppression and, and so many things. And now when you think about this, you, you realize the state of mind the Psalms were being written in. Still do. Absolutely. Still do. They still do. That's right. Amen. Um, then you better understand the hope of the Psalms for the Lord to reign over all the nations and more greatly appreciate their praise for what the Lord has done. Which, you know, um, this is basically the emphasis of the collection of the Psalms. The, the real emphasis, the real theme of Psalms is the Lord reigns. Amen? Amen. So, Psalms, being a hymn book, is filled with references to music and musical instruments. Some of these are in the superscriptions to the Psalms. Others are in the text. Where the Psalms themselves call for praise with all manner of instruments. Some of which we know, some we don't. The reader has to recognize that these are not simply contemplative poem, poems to be studied, but hymns and prayers to be prayed also. That meter and musical accompaniment serve to fix the words in the minds of the people more than any other form could do. I remember when, uh, well, my wife was a praise and worship leader for many, many years. Um, and uh, one of the benefits I had <laughs> as a pastor's wife, uh, to married to a praise and worship leader, was that she had a massive influx of worship CDs that she reviewed all the time, you know, and songs she learned all the time to stay current and fresh and everything. And I always selectively got what I wanted, put in my car and put there. And she had some that uh, we didn't use a lot of, but uh, they were songs. And uh, I particularly liked them. They were taken directly out of the song, but they were put to contemporary current music. And this was back, this was probably 20 years ago. Um, 
you know, integrity music, I think, is what they were. And, and they, I love them. They were awesome because as I would, and I know you probably have done this, as I would begin to learn those worship songs, driving down the road and what have you, uh, I was learning the songs, the scripture. And you know how, it's so much, isn't it easier to learn a song when it's to music? Or to learn scripture when it's to music? And so it was so powerful. And it, just by expressing it. And Israel intentionally did this. Uh, God, I believe, established it and said it that way. And I know God loves music, amen. And God loves praise and God loves worship. And I believe God intentionally created us in His image to like what He likes. And He had motive behind that. And part of that motive was is that music, the Spirit of God flows in music. And as music flows, the Spirit of God flows. The Word of God is able to bind to our hearts, to our spirit. And it's sealed there. And it's net there so that it becomes life to us. Amen. And the many, many scriptures that I'm able to quote today, a lot of them I have to credit to coming from songs that I learned, you know, and... I found myself in a preaching or teaching and quoting the scripture. Those eyes. 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 Oh, that funny look on my face was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lord. Yeah. yeah, that was eyes. Okay. But anyway, you, you know what I'm saying. Amen. Amen. So it's, 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 it's good. Amen. It's good. So the reliability of Psalms, uh, when we talk about that, the book of Psalms has been approached in many different ways. For a long while, the Psalms were studied. For dogma, and basically, there are different ways that, uh, and different reasons that we study the Psalms. And it was studied for dogma for a long time. Now, now, what is dogma? Uh, I think I put the definition. Yeah, yeah, up there for you. It's a system of principles. It's tenets concerning faith, morals, behavior, and so forth. Uh, it is. Uh, it, it, it's. It's philology. And uh, for, for those of us who don't know what that is, I, I define that here. I'll just read it to you. It is, philology is the study of literary text, written records, the establishment of their authenticity and original form, and it is the determination of their original meaning. So that's what philology is. So dogma, uh, it's, it's just basically, it's, it's, it's a system of principles. That's what religion is, pretty much. Uh, it's a study of principles. It's the study of tenets and faith. Um, the Catholic Church is big on dogma. Really, we all are big on dogma. We non-denominational charismaniac people, <laughs> we have dogma, believe me. Amen? Um, the Baptist people have dogma. The Presbyterians have dogma. Calvinists have dogma. Uh, Armenians have dogma in our church history course, the uh, uh, Reformation theology, tremendous course. We talk a lot about dogma and what came out of the Reformation period. Really, really good course. Dogma. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, <coughs> so, for a long time, Psalms were studied for dogma without a lot of consideration given to what they revealed about Israelite worship. And, and even though they were sung in liturgical services after the Reformation with the development of higher criticism, studies began to appear that applied the same critical approach that was used for other books of the Bible, uh, focusing on this philology, poetic structure, and theological ideas. This led to dating the Psalms to much later. And then on the more traditional side, scholars try to identify the historical settings and out of which the Psalms had come, even if there was a, not much to go on. So if we, we look at our outline here, just to make sure I covered everything, we had dogma. Uh, there was, uh, the reason was to understand Israelite worship. They studied it for the sake of philology, uh, poetic structure, theological ideas. And we're going to talk about poetic structure in a little bit. But uh, Hebrew, Hebrew poetic structure is very different. Um, if you read Psalms, you already picked that up. <laughs> than, than what you and I as English literature students are familiar with. Uh, there's not a whole lot of rhyme going on there. You know? um, and then uh, to determine historical content. And then also for reliability. 
also for this day. And the Psalms have stood up very well. Very well. As a matter of fact, we learned in our New Testament literature course last, start to say semester, last month, which each month is a semester to us. Uh, last, uh, well, not really. It's a class. But anyway, last month we learned that of, of all the ancient writings, the New Testament blows them out of the water. And you know, atheists and antagonists, um, uh, uh, agnostic, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. We'll try to argue and dis uh, discount the, the validity of the New Testament. But in fact, the New Testament is vastly more verifiable than uh, Socrates, Aristotle, all, all, uh, all of these uh, famous uh, writings of antiquity. I mean, their original documents are like in, you know, uh, you can count them on ten hands. Up uh, ten hands. Ten fingers. And, uh, and the New Testament is in the, the multiple thousands of, of original documents and in multiple, multiple thousands of, of, of copies within just a small window of years of, of being copied. And you've got vast hundreds or even thousands of years from the originals of the other uh, ancient copies of the um, ancient authors and writers. And people give more credibility to them than they do the New Testament. Oh, anyway, that's another quote. Okay, um, and so, so anyway, it's very reliable, and even the Old Testament is very, very reliable, and uh, we are blessed of God to have a, a God who is a God of truth, and who is a God of stability, and I'm going to tell you what, you won't go wrong with the Word of God, amen? Amen. Amen. Like a friend of mine always used to say, if you'll do right, you won't go wrong, amen? <laughs> Praise God. In the early 1900s, from critical studies provided uh, a somewhat more positive approach of critical studies, making the reader aware of ancient literary forms and their functions, especially in conjunction with the ritual acts of Israel's worship. Form critical scholars also sought to determine the setting out of which each psalm grew, depending more on the form and function than on the occasional historical reference. This identification is not always possible, but the approach did distinguish some types of songs. And I list them for you here. Um, let's just read them off the screen here. We have laments, decorative praises, descriptive praises, royal songs, pilgrim songs, enthronement songs, wisdom songs, and some others. Uh, actually, uh, in a minute, I'm going to give you a longer list. You know what? That minute's over. I'm going to do that now and keep it in the flow here. Um, let me just, I don't have an overhead for this. I'm going to go ahead and add to the other part. And if you're interested, um, I'm also going to give you a little bit of a, a, a description with these and a reference, some references to go with it. And I'm sorry, if, I, I just, this is great right here. Anyway, I just forget some things. Uh, so here's some types of psalms in, in, in a little bit different order here. Enthronement psalms, a description of an enthronement psalm. If you guys want to run these off, we'll, we'll run them off. And uh, can I go through them first? Yeah, go through them first. And then we'll run them off and get them there. So y'all will need to write these down. And uh, I'll go through them, we'll run them off and give them to you, you'll have them, all right? Okay, enthronement psalms. This is a psalm that celebrates kingship. And uh, I'm not even going to give you the scripture references because that'll get monotonous, but you're going to have it, okay? Okay, so a historical psalm is a psalm, uh, it's a type of praise psalm that recounts God's actions throughout history. Okay. And, and they're, they're, really, they're really good. Uh, I'm not going to go back and read one now because we're, we're, we're shooting for eight hours and this class is a 10 hour class. So, okay. Um, but last week I read historical songs are nice to read because they're, they're, they're not written, you know, just as a historical document because they're just a song. But, but they're written more in a story form and they're very nice. So I encourage you to read it. And I would encourage you to even think about um, picking you one out, like Psalm 78, for example, and, and even think about memorizing it. 
you can memorize a historical psalm that, that will only be, oh, maybe 40 verses long, which sounds long, but it's not near as long as the whole Bible. And uh, memorize it, and you'll have a good historical account of the children of Israel. In short synopsis. Amen? Cool, huh? Okay. Uh, corporate lament. A corporate lament is a cry to God from the community. Now, what are you going to learn from this? You're going to obviously learn how to cry to God as a community, at, in unity, as a people of God. Now, Israel was a nation, but they were kind of like the church in the wilderness. So we learn from these experiences how to pull together and how to pray together and how to cry to God together. Okay? Um, individual laments. This is a cry to God from an individual person. A, a pilgrimage. This is the type of song. A pilgrimage. This is a song intended to be sung on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Now, uh, you probably hear a lot because it seems like right now the media is really favoring Islam. You probably hear about Islamic people making a pilgrimage to Mecca. And it's something that they uh, are expected by um, uh, well, Allah, Muhammad, to do once in their life. I don't know that they all make it, but uh, they're expected to try to do it. Well, this is also an expectation uh, of Jewish people, is to try to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem in their life. Uh, I had talked to, just two three weeks ago, to uh, an individual who was part of a Jewish synagogue, and they were actually telling me that when uh, a young person reaches the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, uh, that their synagogue actually pays for them to take that pilgrimage. I thought that was really neat. Uh, so this is even still today something that at, at least that synagogue encourages and, and even participates in sending the young person. But uh, this was something that uh, the, the, uh, the Israelites would actually, on their pilgrimage, they would recite certain psalms. And they would, uh, you know, use this as part of their praise and their worship on the way. Uh, there are actually three theories to this. Uh, that's the one, and well, that's the overall theory. And then the the ideas of, of this journey are that one would be from outlying places, in other words, villages or even other nations or cities as they came in. Another thought or concept or idea uh, historically was that as Israel was in the wilderness, you know, the tent tabernacle was in the center and it was in a, they, were, they were positioned in a cross of different tribes. You remember your study of the tabernacle of Moses? And when you think about one and a half to four million people and that many people living in tents, you're talking about a big cross uh, spread out in the desert, okay? Uh, so uh, we do know that uh, Israeli, uh, Israeli, Israelite history uh, you know, that they would come in to bring their sacrifice and for the, the worship and to bring it to the priest. And it, it could be a little bit of a walk to the center that uh, possibly this also would refer to that pilgrimage, that a shorter pilgrimage, but somewhat of a pilgrimage. And, and we do know that, that they were known to dance and shout and clap and worship as they would go in toward the tabernacle. Of course, they didn't enter into the Holy of Holies, and, but they would come up to it, you know, um, that being one, uh, another uh, possibility. So anyway, uh, and then we have royal psalms. Uh, and this is a psalm on behalf of the king. On behalf of the king, which is a little different than the enthronement psalm. We have song, a song of Zion, which is a psalm. This is a psalm that focuses on Yahweh's presence in Jerusalem. Okay? focuses on Yahweh's presence in Jerusalem. We have temple entry songs. Temple entry songs. This is a psalm intended to be sung as the worshiper enters the temple, which I thought was nice. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody that came through the church door on Sunday morning was already in the presence of the Lord, shouting, rejoicing, instead of the worship leader having to get up there and the pastor get up there and say, come on everybody, wake up. You know, let's, let's worship the Lord. Amen? Praise God. Um, and then we have the Thanksgiving psalm. This is a psalm, uh, kind of speak for itself, intended to express gratitude to God. We have wisdom psalms, a psalm that shows 
a similarity to wisdom literature. Now, uh, I haven't mentioned this, but Psalms is one of the wisdom books in the Bible. You have uh, Job, Psalms, and Proverbs. And somebody, somebody, some people, in, yeah, somebody, some people include, uh, did I say Proverbs? Yes. Yeah, okay. Some people include Ecclesiastes as well in that. Uh, praise is the final one, and it is also a type of the Psalms. And uh, of course, a, a, a Psalm is intended to praise God for uh, His attributes. That's a praise Psalm. Thank you, Pastor. I, I want to say how much I appreciate Pastor Gordon and Donna, yes. and uh, this church, too, for allowing us to be here. Amen? Yes. How long have I been going? I don't have my, my, not, not on my clock. Uh, okay, we should take a break. Oh, I see it. Oh, yeah, I'm back there. I just forgot. Okay, this is break time. We should take a break. All right, guys, take a break.